Hello. Hi. All right. Um, my name is Arielle King, and I'm a 1L here. Um, I'm the SBA parliamentarian, a 1L senator, and co-founder of the Environmental Justice Law Society, and a proud member of BALSA here at Vermont Law School. Uh, being a black woman in America comes with the knowledge that you entered this world with two strikes against you before you can even acquire real thoughts and beliefs that will create the intersectional, multifaceted tapestry of, the per of who you are as a person. Being black in America comes with the understanding that no matter how qualified you are, you'll continually have to prove yourself and your work worth, working tw twice as hard as everyone around you, especially in this particular profession. Being a black woman in America comes with its own silent strength, now affectionately referred to as black girl magic, that covers you, protects you, strengthens you, and reminds you that people who look like you have helped build this country. People like you have fought for rights and freedoms with little to no recognition. People who look like you are continually breaking records and glass ceilings, not just in this country, but all over the world. We are in the midst of a time where people are finally starting to recognize this magic, our magic. It's become harder and harder to ignore as we elevate to ranks and positions no one who looks like us has ever been in before. Some are excited by that change while others are threatened, attempting to thwart the light that exudes from our history, but nevertheless, we are here to stay. Considering this, it is with great honor that I introduce you all today to our 2019 Race in the Law Symposium keynote speaker, Ms. Gwendolyn Keyes Flemings. This phenomenal woman is a change maker, groundbreaker, and avid defender of justice. Her bio is in the program, so I won't read it verbatim. Um, we're all readers in this room. Uh, so, but I do want to highlight some of the key points. Um, with more than 20 years of public sector experience and elected positions in local, state, and federal government, including as chief of staff for, for the Environmental Protection Agency during the Obama administration, she is also the holder of a groundbreaking titles, including the first African-American and the first woman to hold the office of district attorney for the Stone Mountain Judicial District in DeKalb County, Georgia, elected twice to this position. Most recently, Ms. Fleming served as principal legal advisor for Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, in the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. The description in the program relays that Ms. Fleming is here to address the magnitude of, and representation and the duty to create proactive, constructive change, speaking on intersections of representation and public leadership. Given her experience in public politics and public service, environmental protection and litigation, I believe that we couldn't have chosen a better keynote speaker for today. So please help me in giving a warm Vermont Law School welcome to Ms. Gwendolyn Keyes Flemings. Please don't tell me that food coma has set in already. <laughs> no, good, I like that. <laughs> um, what I want to do is just share a few words with you uh, this afternoon. I really couldn't be more thrilled to have been asked to be here. I've heard about Vermont Law School uh, ever since I entered the environmental space, which I guess now is about eight or nine years ago. Very good friends of mine have been graduates of here. Uh, and I was always looking forward to the opportunity to come and see kind of where the magic happens. And so uh, I'll be candid. I wish I could see the magic on a warmer day. Um, I spent 20, I grew up in New Jersey, but spent 20 years in Atlanta. And so my blood has thinned. Um, but I think I at least had the right equipment to be able to brave it. Uh, but I don't know how y'all do it every, every day. But. That just goes to show how tough you are as, as budding lawyers and public servants uh, in the community. So again, I want to thank uh, Dean McHenry, Dean Jefferson, certainly Ray, Terry Ann, Ariel for the opportunity uh, to just share some thoughts with you today. Um, in preparation for my remarks, what I normally do is I have this little cheat sheet that says 55% of any speech that you give is how you look. And so I'm wearing my bright red power suit for today. Um, red was my campaign color, so I always kind of go back to it when I, when I want that extra, extra boost. 
Uh, and it's a little bit of a nod to the 1st of February, being Valentine's Day month as well. 38% uh, of any speech that you give is how you say it, your voice, your inflection, your smile. And so I want to make sure you guys know and kind of hear how excited I am uh, to be here. Uh, and I realize that we're all lawyers and probably not mathematicians, but some of you may have calculated that that only leaves 7% for content. Um, and so very often I figure, I wonder whether if I look good and sound good, maybe I should sit down before I really screw it up. But um, hopefully you'll bear with me, because there are a few thoughts and things that I want to share with you today. The first of which is this passage, which I think you will all recognize. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spirit of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. I think, um, obviously, that is the opening to A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickinson. But what has struck me in recent years is how applicable that passage could be uh, to our current circumstances, where we are, are seeming to live in two uh, contrasting worlds. And it really doesn't matter where you fall on the spectrum, whether it's one extreme or the other, or somewhere during the middle. What I want to focus on today is this question. And it's paraphrasing a question posed by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And that is this. In answering life's most persistent and urgent question, what are you doing in these times to help others? So regardless of the way you view our times, it all comes back to what are you doing in your service? How are you helping others through? It's very easy to get caught up in the headlines and kind of go from one shiny object to the other. But to be honest, that's a luxury to be able to sit back kind of at arm's length and just view the headlines as they go by, whether you're reading the paper, viewing a tweet, trolling Facebook, or reading it on your favorite app, whatever it might be, it's a luxury to just sit as a spectator. And to be honest, it's one that we can't afford. It's a luxury we cannot afford. One of my favorite quotes is by Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, and it says, quote, Every man and woman is born into the world to do something unique, something distinctive. And if he or she does not do it, it will never get done. Think about that for a minute. If he or she does not do it, it will never get done. Now, it's quiet as it kept, or maybe not so quiet since this is being live streamed now, um, I used to be a cheerleader from the time that I was 10 all throughout college. Um, I know I might not look like it now, but I was actually really good. But um, that was way, way back in the day. And much like you would see on TV, cheer cheerleaders build human pyramids. We've all seen that, where you have two young women standing next to each other, or even men, standing next to each other, and one cheerleader has a foot on my shoulder, one has a foot on the shoulder next to me, and you build the pyramid from there. But in building it, everybody has to make sure that they are in the right place for the pyramid to work and that they're standing strong and not uh, infirmed in any way or jeopardizing the uh, sturdiness of the pyramid. That's the only way the pyramid can be secure enough or sturdy enough to be able to build to the next level. Well, imagine what would happen to that pyramid if someone was out of place. Someone didn't show up for practice that day or didn't show up for the game or was there but not 100% their best. They were phoning it in. What if they failed to use their gift or you missed their calling and did not do their unique thing the way Dr. Mays said? What if they failed to stand in the right place? Well, then the pyramid becomes lopsided. You can't build to the next level, or even worse, the period crumbles. pyramid crumbles. 
Our country's future foundation depends on how you and others will build the pyramid for the next generation. Everyone must be in the right place using their unique gifts and talents so that we can build higher and stronger and go further in our society. So I wanna to talk to you today about your rightful place, your rightful place in our societal pyramid and how as leaders or future leaders, what you're doing and the experience that you're getting, how that impacts the shades of authority. Now, let's be honest. Folks have been trying to put women and minorities in their place for years. I thought that would get more of a laugh, but okay, <laughs> maybe not. And it's interesting, this, this speech is similar to one that I gave when I first started as district attorney, and that was in 2010. Um, and so in, my, in those remarks, I talk about how we've all heard kind of the feminist mantra of a woman's place is in the home, and how it was retooled to the women's place is in the House, the Senate, and Lord knows, I hope, in the near future, the White House. But it's just interesting how even a simple slogan like that changes over the course of less than 10 years. How what may have seemed like a dream now seems a little closer to reality. But let's not forget that leadership happens not just at that federal level, but it happens everywhere. In the city council, on the school board, the mayor's office, the prosecutor's office, the legislature, the governor's office, and then I know this is a discussion about public service, but let's not be naive in thinking that the private sector doesn't impact public service and public servants. And so we've got to think about the opportunities to lead in the C-suite at the vice president or senior vice president level, in the general counsel's office, the CEO's office, and the boardroom. What I want you to leave with today is the notion that wherever you choose to serve, whether it's private, public, or where academia, wherever, do not let others put you in their place. It is time for you to take the initiative and find your own rightful place. Flip the script. Make sure that your communal pyramid is built with your best gifts and your unique talents. That could mean anything, whether it's volunteering, starting a business, creating a nonprofit, writing a book, building a school, protecting our environment, or protecting others. And based on my 20 year history, obviously I really hope that many of you will choose public service because I still believe it is the highest calling uh, that anybody can do to be able to benefit a, something bigger than yourself. And one of the people always ask me, and I remember back in the day when I started off as a prosecutor, they would challenge me on that. Why as a black woman would you be part of a system that is known for its incarceration rates of black males? And I had to be honest with them. There were two main reasons. One, I'm a recovering control freak. And so when I have a case and I look at it and I see the facts aren't up to par, I wanna be able to say this is not worthy, officers, I'm dismissing this case without having to ask somebody for it. But the other reason is because we need great people to affect change on the inside so that they can match and be there to hear the voices of those desiring change on the outside. It has to be a collaborative effort. And so I'm hoping that whatever it is, whatever you feel like you were put on this earth to do, be of good courage and do it. Whatever that seed or idea is, that thought that you have inside of you, nurture it, cultivate it, achieve it. Whatever goal you have in life, pursue it. Whatever dream you have, you must make it a reality because the fact that you have it is part of the fabric, the construct, and demonstrating a need for it, whether it's known or unknown to others. But that doesn't really matter. If it's known to you, then pursue it. And it's not just so that you can feel good about your work or your individual contribution. It's because you have that thought, that seed, that dream, so that you can be in the right place, living your dream 20 years from now, 
so that you will have established the firm footing for others to stand on. You know, Dr. King, another quote of his, prophetically states, in the future, there will be born a new generation with new privileges and new opportunities. I want them to know that these new privileges and new opportunities did not come without somebody suffering or sacrificing for them. Now, many of you may know that I'm the daughter of a Tuskegee Airman. My dad served at Bolden Field, Moulton Field um, from 44 to 46. So by the time that he got out, the war was over. He did not actually see combat. But every day that I am confronted with a challenge, something annoying, whether it's raising a point in a meeting and having it dismissed only to have that same point raised by somebody else and it's lauded as the best thing possible, whether it's not being invited to the meeting before the meeting where the decisions are actually made. What I actually think is cool now is very often leadership is female, so if you're in the bathroom, you can get a lot done, <laughs> which I think is kind of awesome. Or something that happened literally two weeks ago, which still amazes me to this day. In 2018, I was standing next to a uh, progressive white gentleman friend of mine, and we were at an, at an event, and two people on two separate occasions came over, shook his hand, and started to walk away. Now, we are standing right next to each other, and I realize that I'm short, but I'm not invisible. And I made the point of reaching out my hand and saying, I'm Gwen Fleming. Nice to meet you. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't see you. Well, all right, I won't curse because it's being live streamed. <laughs> but no matter how frustrating these slights are, and they happen to all of us on a daily basis. There was one other I I in instance where I, I was the newly elected district attorney, and I was the first female. And so this is 2006. Uh, my husband and I decided to start our family, so I was pregnant while I was DA. Again, being the first female, I was the first person pregnant in that office. Uh, and one of the local papers actually did an article about how my pregnancy and my maternity leave would be a disservice to the citizens because I would not be accessible. 2006. But again, I say that these slights, no matter how frustrating, no matter, no matter how angry they make you, they obviously pale in comparison to the beatings, water hoses, the dogs, all of which Dr. King and his colleagues suffered, all of the slights that my father as a Tuskegee Airman suffered, and along with everybody of their generation. And so our being in the right place is in part a futuristic thought so that others can stand on our shoulders, but there's also a historic element so that we can pay homage to those who made those sacrifices and suffered for us to give us the opportunity. And I'm sure that all of you can think of individuals, whether they are personal to you or more historic in nature, that gave you the foundation that you're standing on today. I know my list is long, very long. But we owe it to them to be in our rightful place. We have to continue the cycle and continue to open doors and provide that foundation for the next generation. Now, I won't lie to you. It's not always going to be easy. I told you about the pregnancy story. There are others. Um, when I became the regional administrator for EPA, I did not, and I tell people this all the time, I did not have a background in environmental law or policy. I knew that you're supposed to turn off the light when you left the room, and I knew that you're supposed to turn off the water when you brush your teeth. That was the extent of my knowledge. But Lisa Jackson, to her credit, and she was the first African-American woman to head the EPA, obviously for our first African-American president, she knew what she wanted in terms of being able to open the office and have it have a more communal feel, make sure the community felt uh, wanted and respected in the decisions that the agency made. 
And so they did tons of articles about how I wasn't qualified and how I shouldn't have this position. And it's interesting, now eight years later, I've run into people that have had, that held that belief and they've indicated how wrong they were at the time. So it's not gonna be easy. And there's gonna be times that you doubt yourself, whether you're doing the right thing or doing it the right way, when you might be unsure or even fearful in a particular moment. People are gonna tell you that you're too young, you're not ready, you haven't paid your dues. They're gonna tell you that you don't know the right people, you don't have the right connections. And there will be times when things don't go the way that you planned, but that's just life. People that you count on will let you down. The people that you think you had in your corner will not be there when you need them most. But you can't let that stop you. You must continue to pursue your dream and use your unique gifts for the world. So what I wanna do now is just give you a couple of pointers that I've learned over the years, and they may be things that you already know, and if that's the case, then please just bear with me and make me think that these are somehow original. But the first of which is to make a plan, but also to be open to new possibilities. I have always been a planner. I told you that I was a control freak and it is a long-standing trait going back from the time that I was 16. And so my plan for my life at 16 was that I was gonna get married at the age of 24. I was gonna have my first child at the age of 28. It was gonna be a boy. I, again, 16-year-old mine, I would have my second child uh, at two years later, and it was going to be a girl, so I'd have the happy family. I would be at a cushy Wall Street investment firm, because I knew at, at, at 16 I wanted to go uh, into finance, and that's actually what I studied in college. I was gonna be a BMW, I was gonna be a soccer mom driving a BMW SUV, and <laughs> have a white picket fence in the suburbs while I worked in the city. And I often wonder, what, um, oh, and I forgot the point that my husband and I were gonna be college sweethearts. So it was gonna be a long-standing relationship. Um, and I often wonder what would have happened if like in Psalm 139, God had kind of laid out the book of my future for me and said, I know you've got a plan, but you're making me laugh. Um, this is my plan for you. And God said, you're gonna go to an all women's college, which meant chances are you're not gonna meet your college sweetheart. You're gonna to go to law school miles away from home. You are not going to have a cushy job at a silk stocking law firm. You are going to work as a prosecutor, earning the amount of $29,100 per year, despite your exorbitant law school loans, in a city that's nationally known for its crime rate. And if you think back to what Atlanta was in the early 1990s, that was the case. I'm going to have, this is God speaking again, I'm going to have you run for and enter into two hotly contested elections where your integrity and personal record will be called into question and you'll be dragged through the mud. Then I'm gonna give you a history making opportunity to work for the first African American president, but not as the US attorney the way that you think in terms of this prosecutorial plan of your, or path that you're on but in a whole new field that you know nothing about and you're gonna to have to get up to speed quickly while you're in the process of leading a thousand people across eight states. After you do that for a little while, I'll, let you, I'll give you a promotion to serve as the Chief of Staff for Gina McCarthy and help lead an age of 15, agency of 15,000, but you're gonna to have to uproot your entire family and move 600 miles away to make that a reality. And then, God says, because environmental policy surrounding the clean power plan and the waters of the US and the definition of solid waste is not controversial enough, I'm gonna have you jump into the immigration space. So out of the frying pan and into the fire, where you will lead an agency of about 1,100 prosecutors in their quasi-prosecutorial role. And so if that was the plan laid out to me, I would have been like, look, I know you're the almighty being, but no thanks, right? I can't do it. I have no money, God. I have never been in politics. I have no money. I don't have the right connections. I have no money. I don't have the right qualifications or the money. And I don't want my name dragged through the mud. I wanted to play it safe, do my plan, because it was comfortable. 
It was easy, or so I thought. But how many of us know that even with the best plan, something better always comes along, and you need to be open, because that could be your opportunity to serve or make a difference, and ultimately come to Vermont Law School and have them listen to you for about 20 minutes. <laughs> so even when I was at your stage in law school, I still thought that I was gonna use my finance degree uh, in law, that I would still have that cushy job, albeit as a, as a lawyer, but a transactional one. I still thought I'd have the husband before I turned 30. Didn't happen until I was 35. Kids came at 37 and 39, right before I turned 40. And I thought I would be the consummate superwoman. So while I didn't get what I thought, I didn't get it on the timeline that I thought, I still got it. I still made it to partner, which is something that I always wanted to do. I still have a great husband. We still have great t kids, although they're both boys. I didn't get my girl. He didn't want to go for three. And actually, if you saw his family gene chart, chances are it would have ended up with a third boy anyway. So it might have been kind of good. And truth be known, at, at an earlier point in my career, one of the things, uh, perks as a district attorney is that um, very often when drug dealers are involved with crimes, you get to, um, f they have to forfeit the tools that they use for that crime. And so wouldn't you know it that one of the drug dealers in DeKalb County was using a candy apple red BMW X5 SUV to perpetrate his crime, which just happened to go to the district attorney to be used at her, as her leisure. So I still got my BMW SUV. <laughs> and when you think about it, I may not live in the suburbs of New Jersey and travel into New York, but I live in the suburbs of Virginia and travel into DC. So that's the importance of having a plan. It may not come exactly in the timing that you think, but it does come. One of the other things I recommend to you is that you network tremendously. My campaign manager used to tell me, shake every hand in the room. You never know who votes for whom, who's gonna talk to whom, who can introduce you to whom. And one of the things that actually played out even before campaigning because as I thought about this plan of wanting to be a transactional lawyer, it was quickly dashed when every um, internship that I applied for during my first year of law school, I was turned down. Every single one. I could literally wallpaper my room with the number of re rejection letters. So I was persistent enough to have enough paper to, to literally cover a wall. And I thought my hopes of being that transactional lawyer would, were gonna be dashed. But when I couldn't get a job that first summer, I decided to open up the phone book. In, the, in Atlanta, they're called the Blue Pages, where all the government offices are, and I decided to volunteer. So I called the public defender's office and had to leave a message. The very first person that I spoke to in making my round of calls was somebody in the Fulton County DA's office. That's how I started into prosecution, a 17-year career that culminated with the election as district attorney. But it's because the people that I met in each of those jobs introduced me to somebody else who ultimately got me the job, my very first job, at $29,100. Yeah. So that's why it's important to network. You never know where the opportunity is to expand your circle or uh, connect with somebody. Make sure you follow up. Do the lunch thing or the coffee thing. Find out what they know and who else they know that can introduce you around. And even when I made those prosecutorial connections, I thought, okay, this is a sure bet. I'm just gonna run up the ranks, advance through the ranks, first doing misdemeanors, then felony work, then maybe I'll make it to the U.S. Attorney's Office as an AUSA. That was my goal. I never thought about entering politics. It wasn't on the radar screen. My dad had run for school board, but it's still, was one of those things that he did. I didn't think that I could do it. But all of that changed one afternoon in 1994, and I can still see it as clear as day. I was working for the Solicitor General. He was um, an older gentleman who was running his last race. He knew that in 1998 he was gonna retire. And he said to me, I think by then DeKalb will be ready for its first African-American and first female Solicitor General, and you should run. 
And immediately I started with, no, I can't do that. I'm not qualified. I have no money. Not interested. I have no money. Don't know the right people. I have no money. You're only paying me $29,000 a year. But the truth is, I was terrified. Which brings me to another one of my favorite quotes by Marion Williamson. And it's one that was used by, um, by Mandela. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are more powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? And so as I looked at the field four years later, I saw that there were two other men, neither of whom had ever worked in the office. And I just had this gut feeling that I could do a better job. I knew the people. I knew how they worked. I knew how cases could be moved through quickly. I had some ideas about expanding the footprint and being more community oriented. And my boss had always said that if any two of his former assistants, people that worked for him, ran, he would stay out of the race, out of loyalty. He can't choose among siblings sort of thing. But if only one of them ran, he would support that person unconditionally because he trained them. He would be able to testify to their character and their ability to lead. And so I presumed I had his support. He's the one that mentioned this opportunity. He laid out his plan. And so I ran, raised no money, practically, $37,000 in a race that today easily tops 100. I had to quit my job because I was working as an assistant DA for another district attorney who was supporting my opponent and actually said to me at the time that I told him that I was running, he said, well, Gwen, you can't serve two masters. And I was thinking, I didn't know that you were one of them, but. So I had to quit. And then it came the day where my former boss asked me into his office and I'm thinking, this is it. He's going to give me his support. I can put it on my election materials. It's gonna be the boost that I need. And as, he sat, as I sat in the office, he told me he was not gonna support me. He was supporting my opponent and he wanted me to get out of the race. So it was not bad enough he wasn't supporting me, he wanted me out. It was all I could do to hold back the tears until I got to the car, walking through the courthouse and everybody that I know. But you can't quit. No matter who starts with you, who leaves you along the way, there is nothing more powerful than the voice in your heart. And notice, I did not say your head, because sometimes we talk ourselves out of our own rightful place in the pyramid. You can't let others define you. No one will advocate for you stronger than you can do for yourself. And in winning, I didn't know that that would be the first of my extraordinary things. I never planned to be the first African-American Solicitor General in DeKalb County, but my goal at the time was to make sure I was not the last. And so that brings me to my second round of, or my third round of advice, bring others along. Because to whom much is given, much is required. And since I, I've now been, since I was elected a Solicitor General now literally 21 years ago, it's kind of hard to believe that that much time has passed, all of the successors have been minorities. One white female, two black females, and one black man. As DA, because yeah, after solicitor I ran for di district attorney six years later, all the successors have been minority and, of, and people of color. As regional administrator, at one point, and the way that the RA's office is set up, many of you may know from your time either here at a, a New England uh, or other regional office around the country, there's the regional administrator, there is the principal deputy, or the deputy regional administrator, who's the number two. You have a chief of staff and several other folks in the front office. And at one point, the entire leadership structure in Region 4 were people of color, after there not having been a single person of color at that level beforehand. And all of this was not because of me. I owe it to Lisa Jackson, who took a chance on me, someone who did not have the background that other people thought was necessary, but had the background that she was looking for. 
And obviously, Lisa would not have been in place if it wasn't for President Obama. And obviously, President Obama wouldn't have happened, and for that matter, I wouldn't have been elected without the sacrifices of John Lewis and others during the time who literally shed blood to ensure that we had the right to vote. So the notion of having these opportunities is real. And what you do with them is one of those other poignant questions. Because it's not just about you. It's about opening the door, making sure the door, the door stays open for others. I find it interesting that President Obama, one of my favorite pictures, beyond the one of me and him together, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, he actually agreed with my point in a meeting. And I swear, if you could have seen the bubble over my head, it was like, oh, he agrees with me. Um, 12% of his cabinet was African American, and one of my, my favorite photos is his cabinet photo from the very first term. Because if you look at the level of diversity and how broadly he tried to include others in the conversation, it's just remarkable. He had as many as 25% African Americans in his second term. Clinton had the most of any president at 27%. Bush, uh, one, had 19. This 116th Congress is the most diverse house in history with 52 African American members. There are also 13, or 13% 13 of the population of, or of this Congress are immigrants or child of immigrants. Um, that includes 52 in the House and 16 in the Senate. And interestingly, most of them are representing Western states. There is a poll, though, when you talk about opening the door, and this is where I think it's interesting for us to kind of peer into what the crystal ball will say now that we have this 116th Congress. But during the 115th Congress, the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies did a study about the staff people, how it's one thing to have diversity at the top, but what are they doing in terms of their staff to be able to open the doors even wider? And they found that while only 38% of the population while 38% of the population are people of color, only 13.7 was the representation of top House staff. Nearly three quarters of the House staff, again, this is the 115th Congress, the study was done in September before the election. Three quarters had no top staff of color. There were no Latinos or Latinas, Asian American Pacific Islander or Native Americans who served in the 40 full committee staff director positions or in the other 24 leadership positions, including things like chief of staff. There were, however, 16 chiefs of staff that were color, six of them Democrats, 10 of them Republican. And I say this to say, that was then. It'll be interesting to see what the numbers are as our new congressional members, including two Native American women for the first time in history, get into office and how they are going to open the doors for others. Perhaps they'll open the door for you as you think about whatever it is you want to do next in your career. However you get your opportunity, it's important to bring others along. And as you do, my fourth bit of advice is to make a difference. It's not just about you. Public service is never just about you. It's always about making something bigger or better for somebody else. And so I could talk about some of the different programs that I had as um, Solicitor General, where we fought to reduce teen DUIs through a program called Ghost Out, how as DA we did quarterly crime prevention tours and would go to different parts of the county and ask them what they wanted from their public enforcement officials instead of us dictating what it should be. But some of my favorite stories are at EPA with Lisa Jackson and Gina McCarthy First is they instituted what was called Next Generation Enforcement, Next Gen, where it was the first time where companies were required to post electronically their um, permit values or DMRs and all of those other things so that citizens could know what was in their water, what was in their air. And they built it into both permit permitting and the regulations in a, hopes of making it um, seep throughout all aspects of the agency. One of the other things that Lisa Jackson asked me to do specifically was to focus on North Birmingham, Alabama. It was an area that 
was stuck between several Coke facilities and the air quality was horrible. There were concerns about water, concerns about um, soil contamination. And in the past, EPA hadn't done anything. And not only did we decide that we were gonna do something, but we were gonna do it as a cohesive unit that rather than the air going out one week and the water department going out the next, we were gonna go out as one agency with everybody available. Obviously, environmental justice was a focus of hers, and we did a lot of great work there. But it doesn't matter how much work you do, know that the better you do, very often the more criticism you're gonna get. And that's just part of it. Being in public service and making a difference means that you have thick skin, but eventually people come along. And I often tell the story of a letter that I received from a um, supporter of my opponent when I ran for district attorney. And I think he was trying to be nice. Um, and in it he said, uh, I'm glad to see that you've evolved into a fine and effective district attorney. And I thought to myself, I'm not the one that evolved. <laughs> I mean, I grew, don't get me wrong. But I knew I could do the job. He evolved because now he could see that the job could be done by someone who looked differently and had different ideas, but still be successful. So again, sometimes making a difference is very poignant and directed, and sometimes it happens a little more subtly from our, just our presence and how that can provide a strong foundation and ripples in a pond. The rest of Marian Williamson's quote says, your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightening about shrinking so others won't feel insecure around you. As we let our light shine, we unconsciously give others permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So in closing, I want you to know that everything you've experienced to date, the good, the bad, the ugly, the lessons that you've learned, the great things that you've done, has prepared you to take your rightful place and use your authority in a way that makes a positive impact on this world. It's now up to you to be of good courage and do it. Don't let anyone talk you out of achieving your dream or doing your unique thing or the thing that you were put on this earth to do, not even yourself. Remember, no one else in this world has your individual talents, gifts, passions, or experience, and no one can take your place in that communal pyramid. It's only for you. Remember the quote by Dr. Mays, no one else can fill that void if you don't do it, it will never get done. And there's a whole generation of people coming behind you that are counting, you, counting on you to be in that rightful place and provide the foundation for your and their future success. And so I wanna leave you with one last quote by Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. You here at VLS are that group of citizens. Stand in your rightful place, do your unique thing, continue the cycle, and change our world. Thank you. So I promised Ray, and I don't know how long that went, longer than I thought, sorry about that. <laughs> but I'm glad we started a little early. I, I told him I would take any kinds of questions, so. I got one, I got a nice loud voice. Um, first of all, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Um, many of our students are interested in environmental law and policy, which brings them to Vermont Law School. Can you talk a little bit about what sort of career opportunities you see in the environmental law and policy area, mm -hmm. and also what sorts of um, developments in <clears throat> technology and other areas um, that uh, Avi Garbo has, who you know well, has been an advisor to us on this, 
former general counsel at EPA, that might be useful things for law and policy students, or master's students, to be thinking about um, learning or as a first job out of law school? Sure. Well, I think the opportunities are, are endless, first of all. Um, and obviously, there are the go-to places, uh, the obvious places, like any, any one of the mediums at EPA. You've got, obviously, uh, the legal counsel's office. You've got uh, the Office of Enforcement, OECA. But remember that every medium, air, water, um, waste, which is now OLEM, the Office of Land and Emergency Management, they all have lawyers that support them as well. And so I would encourage you not only to find ways to actively use your law degree, but very often that law degree will help you if you step into an executive position like I did, having run the region and then serving as chief of staff. So go to places like EPA and DOI, again, those should be uh, in the center of your target. But also stop and think about sort of the non-traditional places, the kind of um, non-traditional partners. Uh, I don't know how many of you know it, but of the 17 agencies that are a part of the, well, the former presidents, I think it's still um, something that's in effect, but the Environmental Justice Interagency Working Group, there are representatives from the Department of Homeland Security, the part, um, Department of Defense. So you might not normally think of them as a place that an environmental lawyer can go, but there are environmental jobs and positions at those places as well. So, and then that's just on the federal level. Think about all 50 states have environmental opportunities in the same construct, both squarely within the legal realm, but also in an executive or administrative position. So the field is wide. And you can be as creative as you want to be, I think, and that's where the innovation and technology comes into play, which is why I mentioned next gen. Because I think as we think about what environmental policy looks like in the future, it's my hope that it does increase transparency and that we get to the point where pretty much everybody will have several apps on their phone that are similar to uh, How's My Waterway, where they can kind of take a picture and, and crowdsource what the state of their water looks like or what their air looks like. Um, and so again, the, just the number of opportunities, and Avi's, I, I just had coffee with him a couple of weeks ago. He's one of my favorite folks, and if you haven't had a chance to meet him, um, he would be glad to talk with you <laughs> if you can reach out to him. He's just, yeah, he's just that open. Um, and a brilliant lawyer. Uh, and to track his career or think about the way he views the world through technology, I think is a great gift as well. Other questions? I always tell people, this is your opportunity. OK. You get to cross-examine a former prosecutor, so I hope you're not going to pass up on this. That went all the way to the upper floor. Right? right up there. Go ahead. Can you speak from there, sir? Yes, I have a very loud voice. You might want to give me the mic. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Enjoy your speech. Thank you. Well, I don't think anything's going to be done rapidly because the federal government doesn't move rapidly. Um, that's, that was one of my biggest pet peeves as I made the transition from local prosecutor into the federal agency. When I was DA, if I had come up with an idea on a Sunday night, by Friday I could have contacted the people and started putting things into effect to make it a reality. The federal government never moves that quickly. Uh, in terms of what I think a future Democratic administration may look like, I do think there will be um, diligent efforts to return to what people saw at the end of the Obama administration. The question of whether they can get that done really depends on the timing of this most recent round of Trump regulations or regulatory agenda, and to be honest, whether he has a second term. If he has a second term, then I think it'll be a little harder to do. If he does not, and the timing li lines up such that regs can be reviewed through the Congressional Review Act or other the various ways not to have them take effect, then it can happen a little faster. But to be honest, it really depends on what happens in 2020, what the next four years 
uh, look like and how many of, the, of, of these will be cemented versus how many of them will still be in, a, in an uncooked stage. Um, but things like the power plan, what I found clean power plan to be very interesting and even with the uh, affordable uh, energy rule, ACE, um, affordable clean energy rule, there were companies that did not oppose the clean power plan. You heard from the loudest ones that were in opposition to, of it, but the way Gina built it, several, of, uh, several companies thought it gave them a economic advantage to be able to meet that higher standard, and therefore it gave them a competitive edge. So they were in support of it. So the ones that you hear talking against it, they just happen to be the louder voices at this point in time. But that does not mean that there was not support for it. And I say that because those same people may support whatever new iteration comes next. My challenge or my concern is we can't, uh, it's dangerous to run a government through extremes, swing, swinging the pendulum back and forth between extremes. We really need to get to the point where there are bipartisan support for various initiatives so they can stay on the, less, the test of time. And when you think about companies that are trying to build projects with 20-year horizons, they want stability. They don't want this fluctuation. Um, so again, we need to start thinking about the customers that we're serving, whether it's industry or individuals, uh, and try to craft policies that allow them to plan so that they're not losing money and they are also promoting a safe environment and safe human health. Other questions? I have one, actually. Um, Where are we? Right here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm Mark Rithman, the faculty here. Uh, one thing that has really bothered me for several years now is how did Flint, Michigan happen? And I know you weren't at USC EPA Region 5, but can you shed light on, on the, the regulatory failure there? I wish I could. Uh, I wish I could. How do we know it's not going to happen again? Then? <laughs> well, I mean, I think um, to the extent that bureaucracy played a role, and again, I, I have to be very careful because Susan Hedman was a colleague of mine. We served together. Um, the extent to which the left hand not knowing what the right hand was doing, information not getting shared with the right people in a timely fashion, whatever it might have been, uh, we can't let that happen again. And so in part, that requires you bringing in leadership that has the confidence of their staff so that issues are raised, even if they are uncomfortable issues, uh, so they can be dealt with. Um, and, and it seems you know, very often nobody likes to deliver bad news, uh, but one of the advice that I give to, the, one of the pieces of advice that I give to public servants is what was taught to me is the headline rule, and it played out in Flint, literally. If you know you've done something uh, or a part of something that is about to go wrong, you have to tell your boss immediately, as soon as possible. So they are not reading about it in the headlines. But it's up to that boss to create an atmosphere where um, those negative thoughts or what's viewed as negative can be absorbed and vetted so you can craft a solution. You can't fix what you don't know about. So, um, and again, I don't want any of this to sound as though I'm blamed, well, I, we know that several people have been under indictment in, in that situation, but it, it's the kind of thing that cannot happen again. And what I try to do is look at it from a leadership perspective and think about if that had happened in Region 4, what responsibility do I have to make sure that I put in place to prevent it from happening in the future? Yes, you got two. Uh, you talked a little bit about the importance of, of being part of the system in order to change it. Where do you draw the line between infiltrating a system and becoming a party to it? So it's, it's a difficult line, right? Um, and I think it's one that you can only answer in your gut. Uh, I think all of us have kind of a moral compass that won't let us pa go past it, or at least gives us angst if we find ourselves uh, stepping over that line. 
Um, but very often what I would do when I came in is I would study the office first. So I would spend a good 90, 60 days, depending on how big the office was, understanding how decisions were made, who was making them. Um, and so it may have looked like, like I was being part of the system as I'm just not actively opposing it, but really it was an information gathering session so that when I did decide to make change, it was vetted in a way to be more sustainable. I think it's dangerous for leaders to come into an office and immediately upset the apple cart with not understanding the cadence um, and the other kind of cultural norms. Um, because if you want your change to last, then you need to get buy-in as much as possible and you need to understand cultural norms to be able to do that. So to your question specifically, it, it's a gut check. Um, but if you know that it's part of a process and it's temporary, then that helps you um, analyze that gut review. You had one in the back. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, Kaya Morris, I'm a former state representative here in Vermont, and one of the major issues that we've been dealing with down in my region um, was the discovery of PFOA in our waterways. It happened, we got a tip from what was happening over in Hoosick Falls, New York, a similar story to what's going on with Flint, and so now um, we we came through discovery, the, the vast amount of pollution that we had had, um, corporate pollution that had really, um, has impacted and rocked the southwestern portions of the state. In this past year, I'm getting to my question. In this past year. Um, That's right, I know what it's like to be a pol recovering politician. <laughs> Well, essentially, I'm trying to give you the framework for know, where I'm going for this. Please so um, in this past biennium, um, I was the lead sponsor and presenter of a bill that was looking to do a minor. It went from a large um, citizen's private right of action to a really small, can we just get coverage for medical monitoring for those affected by pollution? And what was so striking was even though we had this incredibly compelling case and there was so much evidence of so much malfeasance on the part of the polluters, the corporate interests that kept us from being able to move that forward were absolute echoes of the challenges that the EPA has found that I under came to understand and even expanding the list of toxins of those that will actually be regulated. And I was wondering if you can talk about that a bit because it was not for lack, I mean granted our governor vetoed it. <laughs> we're very frustrated about that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that person having that pivot point of power Seeing how that bill got crushed was very clear in the distinct interests that the corporate sector has in impeding right. our ability to create yeah. an environmentally just nation. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that because I know that it impacts currently what's happening in the EPA and I'm sure while you were there. <laughs> well, um, actually PFOAs didn't come up to the, the fore when I was, there, that's something that's within the last uh, several years. And again, I left EPA two years before the Obama administration to go over to ICE. But um, the challenges that you talk about are one of the reasons why I've never been in a legislature. Um, I have tremendous respect for ones that do because it requires you to play along nice with others. That's not always my gift. Um, again, I'm a recovering control freak, I like to if I, in, 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 and what I would do is equate your situation to cases that I had as a prosecutor where if I thought uh, there was insufficient evidence or the officer did something wrong, then I have the authority to dismiss the case because that's what justice requires. Um, and so my goal was to always focus on what justice should look like. Um, and I think we do need to spend more attention, spend, spend more attention, time and attention paying uh, attention to p the PFOA situation because it is not just a New England issue. They're dealing, it with, dealing with it in North Carolina. I think those of you that have seen recently Andrew Wheeler's uh, nomination was held up as a result of it. I understand now the gentle lady from West Virginia has changed her mind and is going to let it through despite him making the decision not to um, reform the drinking water standards to account for this issue. Um, it, it's one that we're going to have to watch, and so one of the things that I have always or come to learn is that when it seems as though the door is closing in one area, you can look to possibly open it in another. Uh, we saw that on climate change in the insurance markets, right? Nobody wanted to pay attention to climate change until the insurance market said, we're not insuring you unless you do something different and adapt to this changing climate. 
I think PFOA may be another space where we need to have non-traditional partners or what I call the unusual suspects come to the table and start influencing corporate America or other stakeholders um, and help them make the decisions that they need to make. But that's also an area where, as I started my remarks, having people in the private sector, um, it's helpful to have them there as well and not just the public sector so that you have like minds on both sides of the issue. Other questions? Yes. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, so you mentioned earlier that dramatic swings um, in regulation can be very frustrating to deal with and you need a really bipartisan kind of stance when you're coming up with environmental governance. And I'm wondering if talking about these unusual suspects or, or just getting industry involved in what you want is stability so help us get the legislator the, the le legislature on both sides of the aisle on board with it because it grants stability is that maybe I think I, I think it's required I mean I think to be honest um, I get very frustrated when leaders forget who they're supposed to serve um, that's the kindest way that I could put it. Um, and I say that as a public servant. You know, if I ever took a job where it was all about me, or if I dared run the prosecutor's office in a way that we only prosecute re Republicans because I'm a Democrat, then I would not stay. Hopefully I'd be voted out very quickly. <laughs> um, and so I think the challenge is breaking the log jam and having people remember who they serve and that we are one country under God. And this may sound really naive, but I think we have to get back to basics. We are not a country of Democrats and Republicans. I go back to Obama's 2004 speech. It's not a blue state, it's not a red state, it's the United States of America. And while all of us live in different areas, there are basic things that we all agree with. We wanna drink clean water, we wanna breathe clean air, and we wanna be able to provide for our families. So you've gotta find a way to to economically balance those two things. There are ways to do it, and some of it is relying on innovation and technology uh, to foster research and development so new ways to protect the environment have economic value and can spur new industries. That was one of the things about NextGen, is that it in part spurred this whole um, industry of third party reviewers. So you didn't have federal regulators coming in and dictating what to do, but you had a third party auditor to be able to do that. Um, and so you've got to really, I, I don't know how to do it, I just know what it looks like at the end. For me, this is just Gwen talking, not her firm or anybody else. Yes, sir. You've alluded to the topic, but you haven't really focused on it uh, in great detail. And I think those of us who've had the pleasure of reading the latest uh, science report on the state of climate science from the United States government and the Trump administration uh, have been reinforced in our belief that the threat of climate change is the, is the single most important existential threat to the future of our environment. And, and I'm curious about your view as an insider and having follow the, the, um, the recent political uh, reports. What, what do you think, when the incoming Democratic administration of less than two years arrives on the scene, what, what's the white mask all of Is it the, is it the grandfather that came out then? <laughs> So, uh, particularly in the climate change space, I'm heartened by several things. One, you're gonna have your first hearing on climate change, I think as early as next week, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on the House side at least. Um, I do believe, personally, it is an existential threat, but I've also had to work with folks on the other side of the aisle that won't even say the word climate change. They refer to it as a changing climate. And so, I'm just telling you. Um, and I, I've had to work with federal employees who, because of that edict, 
in panels like what you had earlier cannot say climate change, which I don't see, it goes back to, I don't see how you fix a problem that you don't identify or cannot speak about. Um, but understanding, and that's part of the reason why I started the quote, uh, the tale of two cities quote, we've got such extremes going on in the country that in order to have a successful discussion about it, uh, you have to meet people where they are and perhaps for now, talk about in terms of coastal uh, sea level rise, because that's affecting Florida and pretty much every other coastal state. You've got to talk about it in terms of um, economic losses. Talk about it in terms of military losses. Part of that report was the fact that the Department of Defense uh, views it as an existential threat. So if you're not going to listen to it from a, uh, you think it's a liberal topic, then certainly as a party that is very focused on military and um, mil our military might, perhaps you'll listen to them. To be honest, on some days, I wonder if it's better to just let go of the labels and start focusing on the outcomes, because we need to do something. And if people are gonna get caught up in labels um, and that's gonna prevent a discussion, then it's not gonna serve us. Um, but the other thing that you're starting to see and what I was heartened to see that even as the president pulled out of um, the Paris Agreement, there were companies that were still stepping up, mayors that were still stepping up. Uh, and so that's an example of leadership happening at all levels. It doesn't necessarily have to be at the top in order for progress to be made. And I'm really hoping that that continues um, because we're losing time. And I think about it from my kids' perspective. What am I gonna tell them as this was my opportunity to do something and I didn't do it? I, I don't know how parents have that conversation with their kids or grandparents. I think all lawyers do. I'm kinda, it's kind of cool to be in this room. <laughs> um, you mentioned a couple of times uh, declining to prosecute cases where the uh, investigating officers brought you evidence that you didn't think was up to par, mm -hmm. insufficient. Um, what, as a former prosecutor and someone who's, uh, you know, invested in, as you put it, uh, I don't think you said reform, but being on the inside. Um, what do you think the public sort of at this juncture and in the near term can expect from our prosecutors in terms of responses to errant and unlawful police behavior? I mean, what do you see as the prosecutorial function in, in, that, in that regard? I think they have to have the courage to prosecute them the same way that they would anybody else. Um, and again, this goes back to why I mentioned that prosecutors were part of that leadership thing, that leadership chain. I think 10 years ago, people didn't view prosecutors as leaders. Uh, obviously, they led the office, but in terms of social justice change, they may not have viewed them as a place to be, but you're starting to see that happen more, and you can start to see a little bit of a sea change uh, in how uh, prosecutorial elections are going and the issues that are being raised, and the people that are winning, basically, based on their views of those issues. So I think to some of the newly elected district attorneys in Philadelphia and other places, that are having a more communal approach to their prosecution as opposed to um, the notion of we're just gonna get the toughest sentences, we're gonna be tough on crime, uh, versus what you're seeing now is we're going to be a smart on crime stance as opposed to a tough on crime. So you're starting to see prosecutors um, have more communal-based programs starting to um, do a lot of reform, whether it's on the drug side with drug courts or DUI courts or other things. Um, and in terms of holding police accountable, I mean, that's, we prosecuted officers when I was DA. We prosecuted school superintendents when I was DA. We didn't let a person's title change the evidence. I mean, the evidence is what it is. And as long as you have that evidence, you need to go forward. Um, and again, it's not so much about racking up numbers for you personally. I think it's very dangerous to have any prosecutor count their wins because it creates an incentive to win more. Um, but it's about doing justice and recognizing that some cases are not meant to take the trial. Some cases are meant to be dismissed. In some cases, you're meant to lose. Um, and, and as a prosecutor, it's part of your responsibility to know what those cases are and handle your office with the kind of integrity that garners public trust so that they don't question your decisions. 
whether you're prosecuting a police officer or not. Well, I have one last question then. Um, we spoke briefly about um, the importance of being able to read the institutional culture. And I was hoping that you could take a moment to talk about the difference between uh, the EPA's institutional culture and the uh, NICE's institutional culture in a way that helped you formulate how you were going to attack yeah, your job. They are very, very different, very different. So EPA was a very flat structure. The, um, the administrator came up, you know, she started as a um, public health advocate. So she was always uh, very interested in understanding and hearing from people on the public health side. Uh, both her, both Gina McCarthy and Lisa Jackson had a very open structure. So anybody could raise an issue at the last minute as we're calling the question generally. Um, and that was great in terms of making sure that you heard from every voice in the room. It made it a little bit more challenging to make timely decisions. Uh, but then I went to ICE and it was the exact opposite, where it's a very hierarchical structure based on obviously uh, the law enforcement structure of the agency. Uh, and I was in meetings where I was told not to speak up unless spoken to. Uh, and I was the general counsel. So to me, <laughs> to me, yeah, I'll let that sink in for a minute. Um, to me, both have their place. Uh, obviously, you need to respect lines of authority and make sure things are vetted to a point, but they both have their detractions in that at ICE, you risked pursuing a policy um, simply for the sake of that it got to a particular point in the process. Even if there was an issue that needed to be addressed, it never got raised. Uh, and that's what I was talking about, creating a culture where people can always raise issues so you could deal with them. Um, versus at EPA, it would take us a long time to come to a decision because everybody was still vetting. Um, but they were very, I, I mean, I jumped out of the fire and into the fi frying pan in a lot of different ways and it wasn't just based on substance. Thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to say that um, I'm a food and I'm a food and law and policy major, and I'm kind of um, going to be. Um, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a crossroads of um, finding a job where the money's there, also you're doing good for the community. How would you? What would you, what would be your uh, advice for somebody trying to do good for community as well as make sure that you don't starve to death? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the conundrum, sadly, with public service. And I did forget to mention USDA is a place that you can go in terms of uh, open opportunities for environmentally minded folks. Um, I would try to look at it at a longer spectrum. For example, I spent 25 years in public service and made the decision to step into the private sector largely because I have two kids to put through law school. Or put, oh God. God. <laughs> My younger one is gonna be thrilled with that. My older one, probably not so much. And my husband, who's an engineer, certainly is gonna be pissed that I made that, <laughs> made that jump. Um, but I got to serve and do what I felt was the right thing for folks, and now I'm realizing I need to do the right thing by my kids. And that's not to say that you can't do both. Perhaps you find a partner in life that is willing to take something that gives you great health insurance and kind of that big corporate job so that you can serve and then you guys switch. Um, it, there are any number of ways to solve that issue. And, and to be honest, there are also a lot of companies um, that are recognizing the importance of environmental justice and other things and are hiring in-house. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see what that field looks like a decade or so from now and kind of what moral issues and questions to the gentleman's point earlier, people in those positions may have, but that's a way to change from the inside. It doesn't always have to be changing government from the inside. You could be changing a company from the inside. It's out there. If you, like I said, if you wanna do it, it's out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before you step off the stage,
I'd like to introduce Miriam Hinson. Good afternoon. On behalf of Vermont Law School, Black Law Student Association, Latin, Latin and Caribbean Law Student Association, Women's Law Group, and National Lawyers Guild, I present this award oh, thank you. as a small token of our appreciation. 